Hello and welcome to this Career Insight episode where I'm joined by Devraj Bhattacharya and he is the head of emerging markets trading at Flow Traders in Hong Kong. If you're exploring a potential career in trading, I hope you're going to really enjoy this conversation. We're going to talk a little bit about Flow Traders, what they do. We're going to talk about Devraj and his journey. We're also going to talk about things like key characteristics of what he and his colleagues look for when they're hiring for their team. So without further ado, we'll, we'll jump straight in. Uh, I do know at the point of recording this, Dev, it is a, a mainland Chinese holiday, but you're in Hong Kong. So I'm assuming you're still working. It's been a busy week for you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly been quite busy. Um, uh, for those of you who've been following the news, I'm not sure when this will get record, uh, when this will get uploaded, but China's announced uh, quite a bunch of stimulus to support the market. So uh, that paired with the mainland Chinese holiday means that all of those, all of that conviction and risk appetite is kind of flowing into Hong Kong uh, with um, varying levels of liquidity in the market. So definitely makes for a pretty interesting um, couple of days. Well, look, I know it's been busy times and also it's the end of a week for you on, on a Friday. So I super appreciate you giving up some time to, to be with me today. So I think the first thing we could start with is that I think a lot of people, when they think trading, they typically think of a sell side investment bank and trading. I don't think yeah. they necessarily think about what flow traders do, for example. So perhaps we could start with just a little bit more of an insight of what flow traders does and what its core businesses are. Yeah, so so flow traders is, a, is at its core a market maker. Um, so we provide liquidity in just about everything that we think that we can come up with a fair price of. Um, I think we're probably mostly known for our ETF market making uh, across the globe. Um, so yeah, where that fits with just trading versus sell side trading, it's a little bit of both. Um, to put it put it put it one way, like we don't have any clients, but we certainly provide a lot of liquidity to a whole bunch of participants in the market. So um, let's say that whether it's a retail investor or um, a hedge fund or a superannuation fund or another bank or something like that, if they want to trade an ETF, they'll often be trading with firms like us um, um, to source that kind of liquidity. So uh, besides ETFs, we're also quite active in a whole bunch of other markets. So cryptocurrency, um, commodities, FX, bonds, just to name a few. So um, we try to take a pretty holistic approach to markets in general, come up with systematic ways to price assets and then try to market around those, those uh, pricing points. Yeah. So, so there's the sorts of people you'd have in your team then, would they be all those different products that you have? You'd have specialists within each individual area, would that be right? Yeah. So, I mean, most of our hiring starts off um, just at the graduate level. So very few experienced traders uh, coming in to the firm, which means that we take a very general approach or, or, or a method which can apply to several different markets. So in terms of like specialists for a specific product, sure. Once someone's gra graduated and come into the whole program and been with the firm for several years, like myself, then yeah, I would say I'm a specialist in emerging markets. But the, the team build-up can really vary between having um, traders that are much more quantum focused, others could be much more technology focused, others could be have a higher uh, lean on macro or fundamentals or flows. So the, the, the build-up of the team really varies um, depending on what the asset class is and what the current skills, competencies and requirements of the market are as well. Okay, so that, that sounds super interesting then. So you can come in a fairly vanilla format in terms of you get the grad training and what then you can kind of branch out into what sounded like quite a few different roles there yeah. in the more longer term. I, I, think, I think maybe more recently, specifically for crypto, we have maybe separated the streams coming, coming, for, coming in for graduates. I think uh, a lot of university students these days are probably more knowledgeable about crypto markets than your most veteran of uh, traditional finance. <laughs> People, so um, we have kind of separated those streams to some to some extent, but yeah, it's it's really when when we we really don't require experience when they're coming in, when people are coming in. We're more looking for aptitude and skills and attitudes as well uh, that that 
could that could fit a wide variety of um, applications. Got it. We'll we'll definitely unpack those characteristics because I think everyone will be very keen to know what they are. But before we get to that, perhaps we could just find out a little bit more about you, and perhaps I could take you back, if you can cast your mind back that far, to when you were at university, yeah. and when you were kind of on campus. What were all your peers thinking? What were you looking at as potential options? <laughs> was it obvious to you at that point that you thought this is where you're going to go, or was it was it not? Uh, absolutely not. Um, I uh, so I'd gone into university, um, and I, I first studied engineering. I actually enrolled in engineering and law, but then I uh, decided to skip the law and take up finance just as a bit of a side uh, side gig at the time. Um, uh, so yeah, in terms of like in campus, I, I, I went, I went to university in Melbourne and Melbourne's not particularly known for being like a financial center. And especially back in 2015, 16, when I was graduating, trading as a whole, wasn't even very high on the list of, um, desirable, <laughs> uh, careers, which uh, at least to the extent that it might be now. Um, a lot of the firms were much less unknown. Um, there wasn't much information about them. And, um, yeah, it wasn't anything that I was aware of until very late into my university uh, time. So I always thought I was going to be an engineer. Um, I started uh, some jobs here and there doing, like, you know, like engineering research. Um, also uh, did something in sustainability. Um, and... While I was doing that, I kind of realized that maybe I liked a bit more action and uh, a more uh, fast turnaround problem solving and maybe being a bit more commercially aware compared to what a typical engineering graduate might be. So some of the other stuff that I was doing during university was um, I was uh, part of a startup called ATAR Notes, which is an Australian education company. I think this was like pre-Facebook and Instagram. So we, we had like a lot of... Um, we had like something like a hundred thousand people under under eighteen in Australia um, on our on our forum and online discussion board, and we were creating study guides and online tutoring and content and stuff like that. And I think that kind of entrepreneurial mindset kind of followed through to what I wanted to end up choosing as a, as a career. Um, found out about trading actually just through like an on campus math test uh, <laughs> that that some of the firms do. And, uh, yeah, I found out about it and then realized that this was a bit more aligned to some of the stuff that I was looking at um, at the time. Um, so I played a bit of poker. I was trying to arb sports books as well. Basically anything I could do to try and um, get a bit of extra pocket money. Um, so I realized that all of these things kind of um, may have been more um, suitable for a career in trading as opposed to one in engineering uh, at the time. So it definitely wasn't something that I had my eyes on for a long time. I think um, these days, like especially when we go on campus, like I think kids know that or know that they really want to be a trader quite early on in their career and then will do all kinds of things to to um, build their total profile to, to suit what they think is um, suitable for trading. Whereas I think back then, I think the trading firms, uh, and maybe even to some extent now, they're looking for more like raw skills and aptitude and not necessarily knowledge or particular passion or desire for trading so yeah it's uh it's a bit difficult to to put it all together but um flow traders popped up it was uh six months in amsterdam at the time and then a grad job in singapore and having lived in melbourne for most of my life i thought why not let's uh try and get a job overseas and then you know now i've been with the firm for almost eight years now uh, I thought it was just going to be a couple of years abroad and then I'll come back home. <laughs> but uh, life, uh, life uh, doesn't, isn't always uh, like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, there's a couple of things that I'd love to, <laughs> to ask you about. Um, one was you said about, it sounds like you're a, almost a bit of a hustler back in the day in terms of lots of different things going on. Uh, yeah. That entrepreneurial kind of skill set or mindset, I think a lot of people often think, companies almost demand the opposite which is more corporate so just thinking about those transferable skills because you mentioned like engineering or stem subjects you had your own business that you were doing and so how have all those things how do they translate into core fundamentals of what's useful when it comes to trading 
Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Well, um, I'll start with the maybe the technical side um, first, and then maybe a bit more on the soft uh, after that. So, uh, at the end of the day, financial markets are, in some way, to do a lot with the numbers, statistics, risk, all of these kind of things, and also pattern recognition. So, um, maybe a very long time ago, much before my time or yours, that pattern recognition was uh, even in, in 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 trading firms, just like um, or hedge funds or banks. Like, you know, you kind of just sit in front of the market for a very long time, or you're maybe in the pits and you notice a lot of things and you, you spot some patterns and, and eventually that translates to an intuition um, that is then actionable. And and that's obviously ha- ha- had worked for a very long time and still does for a lot of, for a lot of uh, seasoned trainers. But, you know, now with, you know, financial data and other alternative data sets being so, it's uh, so widely available, um, maybe not always easily available, but widely available. Um, you don't need to rely on that intuition and experience all the time in order to spot patterns and understand relationships and correlations and so forth. Now, once again, I think like the having the mathematics background, um, and whether that's applied in engineering or physics or financial maths, whatever it is, um, that's really just there to give you the toolkit to be able to process a very large amount of numerical information and narrow that down into um, something that is actionable. Um, and that's, that's ultimately that's, that's what trading is about. Um, I think maybe some of the other ways, like I still think about some of our pricing models, almost like engineering systems. Um, you've got a variety of inputs that are subject to certain conditions. There's a certain uncertainty related to the conditions will be subject to. And then, you know, there might be some bends and turns and different temperatures and whatnot that apply to the inputs. And then you're going to get a range of outputs with some certain certainty. So thinking about markets like that um, is something that's just come quite natural to me, but probably was built um, a little bit in university through studying various process systems and and computer systems and so forth in my academic coursework. Um, it's not directly transferable, obviously, because you're talking about very different things, but actually a lot of the mathematics uh, is quite similar. I think, the, so that's maybe more on the technical side. The pattern recognition, I think some people have it or they don't, but I tend to think that maybe some of that is very trainable if you either through a lot of very hard work in a short period of time, or maybe a background which lends to uh, helping that out. So you'll find that a lot of um, really good traders might be great sports players or poker players, chess players, whatever strategic game which may require some kind of pattern recognition and then adjustment in strategy um, once you recognize that pattern. So maybe that's a, a second part. And then I think... Linking it back to the entrepreneurial side, I think there are a couple of ways you can go with it. You can have a desk which exists and a strategy set which exists. And you maybe a certain type of trader might be really good at understanding the current system and the problems associated and the limitations and possibilities of that system and then mastering it. But others will be more looking for what the next system that could be built in a different asset class or in the different uh, market conditions or whatever that is. So it's not always that all traders need to be very entrepreneurial and always thinking outside of the box and always chasing the next opportunity. Because if everyone were like that, then you wouldn't refine some of the existing stuff, uh, which is re- which is very much required in this um, competitive landscape. So, um, but the entrepreneurialism can certainly help a lot, especially in, you know, trying to push for a more market share, push to new products. Um, if you spot something that's happening in the news or um, certain data that you want to go out and actually chase and see if there's something that can be found in there that that you might be able to benefit from. So entrepreneurialism certainly helps. Um, it's not necessarily requ- – the requirement of that can, can vary depending on what you're doing in trading firm. 
Okay, cool. And then the last bit that you were saying before was about you managed to travel a little bit, having never left Australia. So yeah. um, tell me a little bit about that. Is that quite normal for a grad at Flow Traders to go to Amsterdam, Singapore, and then Hong Kong, choose a location? How does that work? Yeah, so uh, very quite normal, actually. So um, our graduate program for APAC and uh, Europe starts in Amsterdam. Um, so they'll, they'll be starting in a classroom environment and then be doing simulated trading, understanding theory, um, playing some games which might help build their trading intuition, that kind of stuff. So everyone that has traded in Asia has started off in that process. Um, I specifically moved to Singapore after that and then uh, was there for a couple of years. And then we moved some of our um, operations to Hong Kong uh, later on. So that's that's why why uh, never in Singapore, Hong Kong happened for me. And aside from that, we're also quite positive on like into office teamwork and and rotations and things like that. So I've I've gone dozens of times uh, out to Amsterdam, New York, um, visited some of our smaller operations in um, uh, Milan, uh, London as well. Um, just get to go and see some of the uh, colleagues face to face, and and I think that that relationship part can actually help quite a bit um, when you're in a multinational company because you can also just lever on their knowledge, resources, experience, all that kind of thing, and, and vice versa as well. So there's, there's, I think what I think probably that is one of my favorite things about Flow that um, that, that 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 is certainly possible and it feels very global in nature. We're always speaking to people in New York and Amsterdam daily, basically. Um, it really it makes you feel like you're part of something bigger than just your immediate desk and team. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, a, an incredible thing as a young person to satisfy some of these different things that you're looking for from yeah. a, your professional, personal life. But Because I was going to ask next about... I know that in Australia, there's a pretty big historical kind of prop scene because I used yeah. to work in the kind of prop scene in London back in the kind of 2010s. And so I'm aware of a lot of my colleagues at the time went off to Sydney and, and elsewhere yeah. to go to Australia. So it's, I would imagine it's quite competitive with hiring within that region amongst you not being the only player in this field. So yeah. We talked about the travel uh, and the kind of some of the structure of the grad program, but what else is there that you think makes Flow quite unique against those other competitors? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. I've thought about this quite a lot. Um, it's obviously pretty competitive out there, but I think that okay, the travel is is one thing, but it's maybe more of a symptom of the the, the broader culture that we have um, within the company, which is highly collaborative between not only desks teams, offices, different business functions. Um, but we don't really have any silos uh, per se. So what that means for someone that's coming in, especially early career, is that you can lever off the knowledge of people at any kind of level within the firm, um, setting up calls, having collaborative discussion um, and, and learning. And that, that really happens like it's very flat in, in nature from that perspective. Um, and I do think it's generally quite different here compared to other firms because it's like the, the level of collaboration that we see that happens between um, just our grads coming in, studying, um, researching things, and then discussing that openly um, and given a platform to the rest of the trading floor. That's something that, you know, knowing quite a few people in the industry over time, it's not really something that is as replicated elsewhere. Um, so some of the things that we do is that, you know, we'll have sessions for research, uh, whether that's on quant stuff or technical or, or macro, and then the uh, juniors will be able to present and then have a collaborative discussion with people who might agree, disagree, have inputs on it. And that whole aspect of collaboration, I think, really helps propel um, your own knowledge um and uh and i think that really helps with the development early on in, in one's training career i think besides that i think the responsibility that you get a flow for sure um supersedes uh, other firms where probably slightly younger on average age i don't have the numbers to to, to compare so um don't hold me to it too tightly but what that does mean is that 
Um, our creatives are given responsibility from early on. Um, they are encouraged to come up with creative ideas. Um, entrepreneurialism is something that is encouraged, especially in the Asia office. Um, we've got a whole bunch of assets which you know, we're looking to expand to and we're always happy to hear out ideas. So I think having that kind of autonomy um, early on in your career, while also being able to lean on that collaborative nature of the firm, presents a pretty unique opportunity to someone that is more like lends more to wanting to to have more responsibility, make more of an impact earlier on in their career. Whereas other firms will have you as a trader assistant or um, desk assistant uh, or, or junior trader and have super high turnovers within the first one year. Flows, numbers on that are probably a bit more favorable uh, for grades because we invest quite a lot into them um, early on. So I think I think what I think that are, are the general, general ben genuine benefits are if you're hungry, you're keen, you want to, you you want to, um, and you're smart, obviously, and you want to implement uh, stuff pretty quickly, and you're always hungry about that kind of thing. Um, Flow is probably one of the best places for actually being able to see your ideas translated to something actionable quite quickly. And aside yeah, from that, uh, maybe uh, one thing specific to the Hong Kong office is that yeah, we've got a very um, relaxed kind of um, team oriented vibe here. We're not too many people, um, which means that um, people and also a lot of expats as well, which means that people are, you know, more than just friends with each other. Um, everyone gets along with each other very well. We have a lot of social stuff. And outings. It's not just that you come to work and finish work and then go back home, which is the case in a lot of corporate gigs. Um, um, I think the Hong Kong office is a bit more like one big family uh, compared to some other um, finance roles you could be doing. Yeah, anyone who's ever been to Hong Kong, I'm sure would have experienced. Hong Kong is a fantastic <laughs> city for, for yeah. sure. Um, so perhaps we could talk a little bit more. We mentioned near the top of the episode when we started talking about characteristics and that's something we talked a little bit about you. I'd, I'd love to know you when you're hiring people, building out your team, what are the kind of key characteristics, skill sets that you're, you're fundamentally looking for when you're, when you're going through that hiring process? Yeah. Um, it's a good, it's a good question because I think we often get the question like, what is the ideal candidate, um, for, for a trading role? And there are certainly a lot of things that are in, in common between almost all good traders, but I tend to take a bit of a slightly different thought process towards it. And, and often the best trading team isn't necessarily just the, the product of all the people with the with equally strong attributes and the same skill sets. Um, if we had the same people who are really, really analytical and really good with maths and um, super good coders, and that was everyone, um, you might not be able to achieve as much as if you had a um, slightly more diverse uh, range of um, team members, but with some minimum standard across all of the multiple different aptitudes that you have. So what does that mean for a, um, tr like a, a grad these days? I think the key thing there is actually like, don't be too afraid to be yourself in a, in a, in an interview. If there's something that, um, that you're really passionate about and you really, uh, that's something that you really like look into and try drive yourself to push, push better. Um, whether that's in whatever it is, like, uh, sports, gaming, technology, whatever it is, like, I think hearing about that and, and understanding that that passion can often lead to a better perception by whoever's across you, uh, across the table from you in an interview. And that actually gives you a bit more insight as to what kind of level of energy and passion could you bring to uh, a trading setup as well. Um, I know I've kind of ventured a little bit beyond <laughs> to, the, to the next step beyond your, your initial question. But in terms of the minimum or, and um, characteristics, which would be elevated compared to any other job, um, I think it really is having the ability and the tools to identify patterns, um, put together pieces of information and relate them to each other. And that is, that's almost always going to require either, um, oh, sorry, 
it's going to require good problem solving skills and good problem solving skills within the arena of data um, numbers statistics and so on so i think and then that, that that's that's maybe a bit more on the aptitude but the specific skills you need to be able to do that on scale now it's pretty difficult to do it unless you're you have a minimum level of data and ability to analyze data via some kind of coding or programming basically so um i think in 2024 it's going to be pretty hard to land a, a job unless you're quite uh, relatively competent in being able to be able to do that so i think getting large data sets finding patterns within that data set and being confident that you're able to do it maybe not to a really heavy level of complexity but the ability to do it um, um quite naturally i think that that is a minimum um, skill set so I think just, just maybe, on the back of that, can, yeah, I, yeah. can I just ask, what when it comes to programming, say if someone was um, at a fairly elementary level, mm. is there a preferred language that you'd like to see them experimenting mm. on? Or does that not really matter? It's just the, the kind of logic of how that's yeah. constructed it applies to all. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think the logic isn't necessarily... Sorry, the specific um, programming language is not really something that we look for. Um, I think more the ability to think algorithmically when needed and think about systems and what, what operations are happening to the system, um, that's a bit more important. So I would say that generally speaking, the, there's some languages that are preferred over others. I think just familiarizing yourself with Python for data analysis um, is probably one of the better ideas, but certainly not if you if you only know MATLAB and R and C and Java. It doesn't mean I'm not saying that you should go. Oh, you have to go out and learn Python. Definitely not. If you're if you're comfortable with algorithmic thinking and look at the end of the day, at least reading code and uh, and understanding what it's doing, it's pretty straightforward across multiple languages, right? So if if if, if or it should be straightforward across multiple languages. So um, being able to do that is, I think, more important than knowing one specific programming language. Cool. Um, could you just explain to me a, a little bit about, more about the actual um, lay of the land of the members of a team? Because I think a lot of, there's a bit of a misconception that it's like everyone just thinks, everyone's just trading or they're, they're a yeah. dev. Yeah. But I'm assuming, because you mentioned before about there's other people who are thinking more macro and there's other, there, so I'm assuming there's researchers, there's other people pulling on different skills to get the greatest output as a team yeah. so other than just a trader executing let's say using the tools or the yeah. dev creating the tools what are the other elements and players within that team yeah it's a good question so we um broadly characterize a lot of our traders into a couple of different categories um for products which are maybe a bit more like speed sensitive and highly competitive um but the pricing is very obvious. Let's say you just have a gold uh, piece of gold in one country and a piece of gold in another country. They should be rough, They should be the same um, at any given time, um, assuming there's no costs. So if that if the price moves in one place, it should reflect elsewhere. Now that's not necessarily requiring really really good data uh, <laughs> data analytic skills, but may require a lot more in terms of processing information quickly and then turning that into a trading decision um, at another venue, for example. So it might require a bit more on the technology side of things, like understanding how data is transmitted, how do you most efficiently um, get that data? Do you want to predict something based on whether um, on just some of the information that comes in a little bit quicker than the others? So that might be one set of skills where it's like technology driven um trading um and they should also be very familiar with the technology behind what exactly is coming in and what is what is going out so it can get a little bit complex so i won't get too much into it also because i'm not one of those <laughs> uh the other is that they're um i would say a bit more quant focused where um understanding the fair value of an asset um, it might be a function of a whole bunch of other things, whether that's um, 
whether it's some, some, something very simple like an ETF where all the underlyings are open. That's a bit straightforward, but an ETF where some of the underlyings are not tradable, meaning that there is some uncertain factor in the pricing and nobody knows what it is exactly. Having the statistical skills to um, come up with what the fair value for that is um, might require a higher level of data analysis and so forth um, from that perspective. And similarly, if, you, if there are patterns in the market and you spot them, um, you might need to have the skills to um, identify that pattern, test it, um, figure out what you would want to do if you if you think um, what kind of what kind of strategy you would want to trade around it, and and having the skills to back test it in a, in a very robust way. So that would be more on the quant trading side. And then, while there aren't too many traders that in in, in firms like ours that do this exclusively, but then there's also like a bit more of like a fundamental macro flows driven side of things as well, where something is very difficult to predict. It's not very well modeled um, by the things that I described in category two, but it might be outside, it might have an outsized impact due to the behavior of other market participants, due to news, due to um, um, particular flows that might be occurring. So processing information at a maybe lower frequency, but then making having the conviction to make the appropriate pricing adjustments um, or make the appropriate pricing decision um, based on new information that's coming in. So that's a bit more on like the spread macro fundamental side of things. Now, in reality, some traders, almost all traders will have some blend of all three of these. Maybe some of the tech guys won't have any of the fundamental and they just want to keep everything super systematic. But for the most part, some blend of all of that um, is quite useful in the ETF space, especially in the international ETF space where, for example, you're sitting in Hong Kong and you're pricing things where the underlying could be in a whole bunch of different countries. Yeah. Cool. So I think that's set us up quite nicely then to talk about the, the opportunities at Flow. So yeah. th those kind of three categories, would you go into those three categories or do you go in in a center grad where you have a bit of exposure of all and then you kind of build yeah. out from there? What does that look like? Yeah, so once again, like it's not a necessary component of our hiring that that everyone that's coming in even has like a very strong conviction of what kind of career that they want to take. It's uh, But if they find it super interesting to to make contributions, look at problems, look at data, spot patterns, like we can try and bring them into our our, our um, grad uh, grad program, and then try and they can and kind of work through together what their strengths are, and maybe not just where their strengths are, but what what kind of potential they have to to branch out into different things. So it's not really that every single candidate comes in. And it's like, all right, we know this is going to, this person is going to be a quant. This person has stronger macro aptitude. This person is going to be better with technology. It can really change. Like I, when I when I first came in, I definitely thought I was going to be much more on the te technolo technology side of things. I was very um, interested in how you know data was sent between exchanges and how to make um, make uh, accurate predictions based on uh, how how that data is sent, so whether there's any advantage to be had there. But then as time progressed, I d definitely developed much more of an interest in just things that were going on in the world, um, whether that was, that's from politics, news, or maybe like individual companies as well. Um, so making that, that, app, that those kind of one-off applications to, um, to a broader systematic uh, structure were, I found to be, something that, that I enjoyed more. And obviously that's a lot more applicable in emerging markets compared to your developed markets, for example. So, um, yeah, the, the, there's kind of two ways it can go. If someone's come in and it's very obvious they're going to be a quant, uh, I think that is certainly possible. I think there are a lot of people with certain backgrounds that you know that they're probably not going to be the ones to um, put, perform excessively well under pressure and take on a whole bunch of risk uh, in a very short period of time. And they may be more suited to looking at a problem holistically and, and making a structural solution to that problem. So, and then likewise, um, sometimes it just works out different to what, what you might think. And, and I think the grad program 
at any grad program, not just for flow traders, like there's no way that just out of university that you're going to go into your job, whatever it is, and it's going to work out exactly how you thought it was going to work out. I just don't think that that happens unless maybe you start your own thing. And even then, probably not. So um, I think I think it's important for, for uni grads to recognize that, you know, it's not just uni and then getting the job. Um, there's a whole there's a whole array of, things, array of things that can happen from there. And things might not go as you expected or um, either in a very positive way or, or, or maybe you just like really don't like being in a trading environment or a high fast paced environment and it really doesn't have a reflection on your overall capability or worth, right? So I think it's I think it's important to have an open mind and not get have too narrow a focus when you're when you're just starting out. Um it's it's good to have an open mind and figure out and just learn as well, just 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 soak in what, what, what people are saying and what, what's out there as well. So one question, because I get to talk to lots of kind of senior traders and as yeah. you were describing about um, problem solving, being able to take risk, all these different types of things. So resilience is a word that comes up quite a lot when it comes to the field of, of trading, but resilience yeah. can have lots of different forms. It doesn't necessarily need to be you're in the trade, so to speak. But yeah. as a team leader now, how do you try to build out in a young person a resiliency factor to to help them progress and improve individually yeah that's a, that's a great question i think resilience is probably one of the most important things in trading i think that you know if you're in this role no matter whether whether it's at our company or anywhere else like the number of situations per day that you put yourself in or your work puts yourself in and the outcomes that you could be subjected to are pretty pretty varied in nature so you can you can do all the right things and have a very bad outcome you can do all the wrong things and have a really good outcome and those kind of things can persist for quite some time um so kind of understanding the you know best that we can do as individuals okay is to understand our process um, and understand that you know if we got if something happened that was out of the ordinary, whether on the good or, or the bad side, that you don't just kind of like dismiss it being like, okay, well, if it's good, it's all skill, and if it's bad, it's all bad luck. But having that kind of like that that, that lens to think about um, the process and improve continuously is far more important than always just guaranteeing really good outcomes. So it's really, really easy to make mistakes in trading. Um, and I'm not just talking about mistakes in losing money. You can make a mistake and make money. But and, and we should be equally critical and equally willing to improve and reiterate and, and learn um, regardless of, of what the outcome is. And I think that's, that's super important. So I often have a junior that has made a mistake or has even maybe um, come up with a great idea and we've signed off on it and had a very bad outcome. And they they might be very worried about what the consequence is for them. Um, and the what I always say is and what the reality is, it's not it's not some hyper cutthroat environment where it's like, okay, well, that's gone wrong once, uh, that's gonna keep happening. We're 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 ending this here. That's definitely not what what trading is about. I think where the resilience comes in is that, is kind of picking up after a situation or after something that's really busy, for example, um, in these last couple of days, and having that kind of presence of mind to say, oh, there's a lot of interesting things happening today. Um, do I need do I need to review something? Do I want to go back and look at some of these spots that happened? Um, what would I do differently? Maybe, maybe the answer is nothing. Um, but having that kind of mentality of kind of always wanting to improve and think about process and opportunity and potential, I think that is what's more important than always just being the right thing and only only making trades or only making decisions that that profit. Um, 
Because I can guarantee you that if all of your trades only ever make money 100% of the time, it means you're leaving a lot of money on the table or leaving a lot of market share or whatever it is on the table because it means you're not taking enough risks. So I think having that resilience uh, is certainly super important and, and picking yourself up and, and trying to be constructive about the negative things that happen at, at work or in life even um, is is quite a strong characteristic, to, a strong trait to have. All right. Great to get that that insight. And the, the final question to to wrap up. Let's say, let's say you are the twenty year old version of yourself listening to someone, i.e., you now. If you yeah. could be that, looking back and thinking, what word of advice do you think that would have been super useful for me, or encouragement, or or insight to just help at that juncture in your in your life? Uh, within the context of just being looking for a job or looking for a job at flow or just in general <laughs> just 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 yeah. in general because i think the yeah. general probably applies to to flow as well yeah i think um maybe maybe before career and everything i think you should if you're in university you should really enjoy and enjoy that time that you're having there there's there's nothing really quite like it <laughs> and, and you know everyone that's a couple of years out of university would probably tell you the same i think uh maybe one thing that but maybe not a regret, but perhaps like um, something that 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 I would give myself the advice is just to try and learn more about different things that that different people are good at, um, no matter what that is. Um, well, I definitely in university thought that okay, ah, oh, I've got to do this stupid subject. Um, this is not going to be useful at all for me. Like, um, but you might have a professor or um, reading material, whatever it is, that it would still be quite insightful to to know as an individual and, and and you never know how the expertise of someone in one field might help you in building your own specific context in another field so i think levering the resources that you have in university your lecturers your student associations um, companies that come and visit you just hear them out and and try and have some conversations with people and and if someone is particularly if someone's like quite passionate about something and they're willing to share a lot with you about how they view it um having an some an open mind to to that is super super useful um whether that's in trading or in general like i i will i've got friends out here in hong kong that are uh, chefs or um bartenders at these like top 50 cocktail bars in in asia or whatever and I, and the way that they look at whatever it is that they're doing is really quite inspiring in terms of how I can try and apply a similar mentality and mindset um, to on that on that side as well. I think maybe a bit more, um, maybe a bit some more formulaic advice is that uh, um, there are some things that maybe don't necessarily help you get your foot in the door, but will not having that might exclude you or or delay opportunity going forward. So I, I do recommend that, you know, if you're looking at trading firms or even uh, amplifies partners with a lot of investment banks, hedge funds and so forth, like at the end of the day, any firm that is has a good graduate package is going to get a lot of applications. If there's a lot of applications, um, our lovely colleagues in uh, – uh, in HR and recruitment, we'll need to use some rules-based methodology to narrow down that field. And, and I think I think students know what that is. You you should if you should try and get good grades where possible. You should um, show you should have something to show for the time that you spend working on other things or spent on other other, other uh, extracurricular activities or sports or whatever it is that that you spend your time on. You should have something to show for it. I think. And if you don't think you have something to show for it, really take a step back and really think about um, why that's the case. And maybe you're actually just missing something uh, out, of, out, of, out of the things that have kept you busy. So I think maybe that's, maybe that's another one. So take what you're doing seriously at the time uh, at which you're doing it. You, it's, it can be very difficult to repair things like um, not having 
the right grades or not having any programming or coding skills whatsoever or not having not read a newspaper for like four years like you will it will reflect and you will look silly at some point so so definitely try and make the make the most of um, the time that you have um, in university and aside from that uh, have fun like you know you're only going to be young once um, don't get too bogged down in just studying all the time or just um, tailoring everything that you do towards one company or one one um, one industry. I think people at the end of the day also want to work with people and uh, you should it, it helps a lot to just come across um, a bit more personable and conversational and, and have, have things that, that people want to connect with you for as well. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great kind of sentiment to finish on because that yeah. culture, you know, I love. Yeah. And as, as a young person, I would have been absolutely, you know, like being told by someone who I'd aspire to be that actually, yeah. you know, I can be myself and exp yeah. have experiences more than just focusing, like laser focused on finance, for example, yeah. to become a round individual. You know, it sounds yeah. like Flow is a great place to, yeah. to flourish in that It might be that, a bit specific to Flow. I don't necessarily recommend... Uh, if you're going to go into a hypo client facing um, kind of gig to to be overly yourself because that might reflect on how you might communicate with clients you might have different sensibilities and so forth so obviously i'm speaking from the lens of someone that's just worked in this kind of environment for my entire career basically so try and understand uh, the, how, how it might vary based on who you're talking to as well okay and then the the, the flow apac team they're hiring right now is that correct yeah, so um, we're, we're always hiring uh, for traders. Um, some of the other stuff that we uh, are hiring for are quantitative researchers who, rather than um, trading the market or um, implementing strategies into the market directly and monitoring them and adjusting them, they would be researching the ideas behind what goes into those strategies. So that that's, that's both on the graduate uh, and experience level and also uh, macro analysts is something that we're always looking for people who are able to process what's going on in the real world and understand how that impacts our overall trading systems and obviously you know uh, uh we also got an intern intern program um, which is currently open for uh, apac students um, that'll be next summer in hong kong so june july we have tailored it such that it also fits um uh, people in the southern hemisphere as well for their winter winter uh, uh, vacation. Um, so yeah, there's an intern and grad trader and then quant researcher and uh, a macro analyst, which is all available to um, potential gra uh, graduate graduates as well. All right, cool. Well, what I'll do is if, wherever you're listening to this, whether it's Spotify, Apple, YouTube, just check the comment section or the bio of the episode and we have all of those links that Dev's just mentioned that you can click on. Uh, awesome. But Dev, thank you very much. I know, as I said, it's the end of the week. It's been a busy one, but look, yeah. absolute pleasure talking to you. Some great insights. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. And uh, yeah, um, it's been great talking to you as well. All right, all the best. All the best. Take care.